Good day, dear participants. Welcome to our distinguished audience. Welcome to the workshop section. We'll be talking today about how modern tech helps us to grow our business. My name is Evgeny Duko, and let us begin. But before we begin, let me tell you that every single one of you has an opportunity to ask questions to the speakers. In the framework of a session, there will be a ton of participants, including those entering this stage. And live, they will be telling about the things that they wanted to convey to you. So today, have a chance to ask them questions directly. So please do not hesitate to use this QR code that you can see right away on screen. Please grab your smartphone or another mobile device, scan the QR code, and join a platform where you will be able to ask questions to the guests. Let me remind you that we will be, from time to time, showing you this QR code so that you would be able regularly ask your questions. We'll be trying our best. We'll be trying our best to transfer your questions to the guests and we'll try to answer as much as possible. So let us straight on begin. Most of you probably have heard about the leader of the market for business analytics, SAS company. A couple of words about SAS. In 2020, SAS got the best scores in the reports of the leading agencies such as Gartner, Forrester, I IDC, and by all means, this year SAS is a partner of the business conference AI Journey 2021. And today we have two leading experts from the company joining us to tell about climate-related risks as the up-and-coming trend in banking. And let me again remind you that you can ask questions to our speakers. And please now welcome the director in charge of development of SAS, uh, Mikhail Knyazhev, and also the director in charge of uh, financial risks, Mr. Jan Yegorov. Mr. Jan Yegorov. Good day, good day, dear participants of the conference. Let me start our workshop. I would like to discuss the theme of ESG together with my colleague. We've mentioned the ESG as a term many times during conference, but they invited us to talk about this particular phenomenon hands-on and tell about what is happening in different industries, how they are embracing these trends, what technologies they're using, and in the end answer the simple question, should you invest your time, money, effort into ESG? I do understand that uh, we have representatives of different industries at the conference. I hope there is young generation as well, and probably not everybody is particularly interested in banking, but we particularly selected this segment today because bankers are those who are best equipped to answer the question whether you should invest or not. For two major reasons. First of all, bankers know how to count the money. And secondly, if they invest, they are probably anticipating something in return. And if bankers give money to the clients, probably bankers are influencers to all of the industries that they invest in. So together with my colleague Jan, today we'll be telling you about what is happening with ESG. So let's start with question one. How do you understand whether this is only a flim of fashion or it's a trend that is long term and here to stay. Of course, it would be great, for example, if some global agency would release some sort of hype cycle, such as Gartner, for example, that every year uh, rejoices us with various hype cycles where we can see a couple of important things access. So where the trend is at the moment, whether it has been able to find its peak, whether it's going up or down, and whether it's at the plateau, for example, and then understand how much time it would need to go to the plateau of productivity. That is an important element because uh, ESG is not the first term that we have been hearing in the last 30 years related to ecology, social responsibility, etc. We remember a ton of terms that were introduced in the beginning of aughts. 
And they ended with some logical conclusion or ended with a fluke. We remember that sustainability is a major trend and has been a major trend expressed in major indices that we observe today. However, sustainability has not yet went to plateau. Kyoto Protocols, we should recall. Everybody believes that we will be trading emissions in the framework of Kyoto Protocol, making a change in ecology and climate risk, but that's not happening actively at the moment. We know that the successful examples, for example, reach um, chemical legislation, noise legislation, noise limitation legislation in Europe. In a year or two, that came to a format whether either you comply or you quit business. Unfortunately, we do not see that sort of hype cycle. We are, don't know the answer yet. So the only thing that we can look at is the informational background. And in the news, we only can hear ESG. But if we rewind a couple of months back, we recall this figure 2.8. It said that you are online. I would really love to ask you, what is 2 and 8? Who knows about 2.8? This is a figure that was mentioned by our Ministry of Natural Resources in Russia. That is the warming in Russia. Warming in Russia is 2.8 times faster than across the world. And that was a very trendy figure a couple of months ago. Another thing that um, probably not many have noticed, whether it's a trend or a hype, we can take a look at other media mentioning uh, the most significant global climate figures. Take a look at what has been happening in 2020. On the one hand, we were participating in the trend. Of course, Russian was there as well. We can see the figures. $210 billion were losses from natural disasters. Probably that's a lot, $210 billion, but if we take a look at 2019, that was $240 billion. So, having taken a look at this figure, we don't know whether it's critical or not, whether you should invest too much into this or not. So, when in our business we work with various industries, including banking, we're making conclusions not only based on theories, but also what's happening in terms of business. And we might notice that the thing that is happening now is the range of events, regulatory background, that will lead to very significant um, investment inflow in this particular area. There is the alliance of central banks and other financial organizations uh, called AGFS. This is the NGFS. This is the alliance that would not only be sharing best practices, this is the alliance that generally describes how banks, actually describes how banks will be managing this particular domain in terms of uh, stress test, collateral, risk evaluation, etc. This organization has described the situation so broadly that I believe when you as a business or as a company decide to invest or build teams, you will have a, a large scope of responsibility because you would have to take a look not only at the potential risks regarding earthquake or flood, but also you will have to take into account for the transition risks when, for example, as a matter of fact, legislation is changing, trends is changing, transit is changing, or the new source comes up. For example, we don't have yet AI tools to evaluate that sort of risks. And I would like to go into some more detail with that. Let us invite Jan Yegorov, my colleague on state, to talk about regulations for banks because, as a matter of fact, fact, banks began making first steps and taking a look at how their current processes and tech in terms of AI need to be transformed towards ESG. Jan, please continue. Good day, dear colleagues. I'd like to thank Mikhail for giving an intro to the problem. Indeed, this summer we have felt it. We have felt the impact of warming. But I love treating climate risks from the standpoint that it's easy to put together people around a particular solution. If we want to solve this problem somehow, we need to understand how to tackle the problem, how you can tackle the problem. Where's the range for data analytics, for modeling, for forecasting, where you can apply all of these things. And the first thing to take a look when you want to figure out what is happening in the market and how market banking regulators are viewing the capabilities to evaluate climate risks. For that, we need to take a look at the 
legislation that has been published in the recent years. Let's look at the last five years. There was a number of uh, recommendations in terms of how it's worthy to evaluate climate risks, which scenarios and classifications are the most appropriate. But essentially, essentially, it's again, recommendation or guideline. There is no clear-cut uh, approach. And we believe that both Basel and uh, Russian Central Bank will have clear-cut recommendations. As for uh, Western experience, uh, I believe that European Central Bank is the most advanced there. We'll talk about it in more detail later today. And Russian regulators are also paying sufficient attention to the subject. Last year, they released a range of uh, major practices and approaches to evaluation of climate risks. It's easy to take a look at. And also, large Russian Ministry of Economic Development released a number of recommendations on what sort of metrics and figures it is possible to evaluate the uh, potential um, and how of, of, of threat in a particular region, how prone the region is to earthquake or flood, for example. So Russian ministries are not falling behind. Another bonus is that in this article we may see a number of scenarios for climate risks and also a range of sources where we can find the data. For example, uh, the data of Russian Meteorologi Meteorological Agency in terms of forecasting climate change and dynamics. Amongst all of the regulatory bodies, I believe that European Central Bank is the most advanced in the particular subject that we're discussing. So let me point your attention to what they have released, what sort of norms they have released. First and foremost, this year, European Central Bank introduced, uh, hosted stress testing top to bottom when they have requested from their uh, regulatory bodies a range of um, data structures in terms of portfolio, in terms of balance, and based on that aggregated data for the entire EU, the bank has been able to forecast dynamics for another for the entire sector in the aggregated way evaluate how much the sector is prone to the impact of climate risk. There was a number of technical points that I will return to in terms of modeling, but we are especially curious about the conclusion, the result. And here it is, based on the European Central Bank conclusion. We need to start right now. We need to start right now. There are three different scenarios. Business as is, as though we're doing nothing and just fast track into global warming. Scenario two when we start doing something actively right now. In scenario number three, if we are doing everything as we should, correcting our CO2 emissions, etc., but we're doing it with a delayed effect. And consequently, obviously, we need to start right now, because over time, the losses regarding floods, um, wildfires, or melting of tundra will only get worse. That's conclusion one. But this exercise also allowed us to make a step further. As I've said, this particular approach is stressed as bottom up, uh, top down, top down, executed by European Central Bank independently. But we need to understand what will be happening with a particular organization. How can a particular organization host stress testing? Because regular bank employees do not have all of the range of info that the central bank has. However, they have more detailed bank on uh, information on a particular bank. So next step for ECB, much more useful for us, because they have moved from top down stress test from to bottom up stress test when they provide recommendations to every bank on how it's possible to analyze the susceptibility to climate risk and these recommendations are exceptionally fresh they have only been released a month ago and the stress testing will be happening in spring next year every bank will have to provide they filled in questionnaire in terms of how the bank is ready to the climate change and the availability of corresponding norms. And these questionnaires are becoming even more popular on a Russian market. Because, well, the first thing that the bank can do is publish ESG strategy on its website, then learn to fill in this particular form, and then develop uh, very own forms. And the ECB 
questionnaire is a good starting point for banks to take a look at what they can do, what the regulators may expect, and how this questionnaire can be used to analyze your very own bank and your subsidiaries and counter agents. Next thing that we need to discuss is the range of metrics for climate risks suggested by ECB so that we can understand whether we are dependent on a particular industry that we are investing into especially if the industry is, is particularly susceptible to climate change. For example, the we're talking about mining, coal mining in particular. These sort of industries at a certain point of time will feel an impact of changing legislation. So let's talk about how we can stress test our organization. Let us suggest a number of organization scenarios both for transition risks, for example, due to the change of legislation or the change of structure of uh, energy production, etc. The industry will experience losses. Also, uh, there are recommendations on physical risks such as our mines may be flooded because of the flood or Venezia, Venice will be flooded by the flood. So it's a good document to make a first step and understand um, what, how can we stress test our organization because we all know well that when managing risks, um, the very important step after identification of risks, uh, evaluate the risk and understand how critical it is to us. So the experience for ECB teaches us that this exercise is not an easy exercise, even in a case when bank um, needs to provide minimum volume and info, there is a ton of problem. The first problem is classical data problem. A lot of European top banking top managers notify that climate risks is a huge problem in terms of data because historically they have not been collecting lots of data and there are no centralized and truthful uh, sources of data, for example, for CO2 emissions. So data is a big issue, as usually. Another thing, too far uh, horizon, planning horizon, that's just too far. Planning for 20 and 30 years into the future is a bit too hard compared to especially one or two years into the future, which again increases the risk of the model. Therefore, it's important to validate models, to validate all of the assumptions of the experts. All of that must be thoroughly validated. So it's very important to do attributive analysis for the sensitivity of the model so that we are sure that we can trust the model and uh, decide whether it's better to invest our effort into automation of data collection, for example. If previously we used to consider our um, counterparts as financial counterparts, we mostly cared about their financial um, paperwork and documentation so that we decide whether we give them the loan or not. Now it's important to understand where that particular counterpart is situated, where the assets are situated. Again, if we talk about a mining company, for example, that delivers products via the pipeline that's built in tundra, which is melting. Or uh, the pipeline is in the forest that may go on fire. So you should understand where the geographical risk is. Another thing that is very important for Russia, uh, that is technical maturity. Because Europe arrived to, to this problem when most of the banks transitioned to this advanced approach of uh, risk estimation. We have only three banks that can do that in Russia. As you may know, many banks in Russia are still considering, are, are still making their uh, calculations in Microsoft Excel. They don't have uh, integrated stress test systems. So we believe that in the future, the regulations and norms will be constantly changing. In this particular situation, we are less ready to future changes, less ready than Europe. And this is something that must be taken into account. Still, when we evaluate risks, we also speak about opportunities. Let me do that either. Let me do that as well. Essentially, 
this unification, this this um, uh, organization of central banks and GFS provides ready-made described scenarios on how CO2 emissions will change globally, whether the world will get warmer or colder, how will unemployment shift. So these scenarios could be taken as a baseline. And they are very well described per region. So we can take these scenarios and begin modeling how these scenarios will impact particular balance sheet elements for the banks. How the banks are, are susceptible or prone to the impact of these factors. Next stage is evaluation of the impact of these factors on the counterparts. And it's very similar to what banks are doing now in terms of uh, credit risks when they make decisions on whether provide a loan or not. Uh, the banks are particularly taking a look, a closer look at the business model of the counterpart, at the markets of the counterpart. I'm talking, of course, about bigger companies here. So here the approach is pretty similar. We will be taking a closer look on whether the bank, whether the counter agent is um, uh, uh, particularly tied to the markets that are prone to climate risks or energy delivery or a raw materials delivery that might suffer due to the uh, climate risk. This all will be taken into account and over time questionnaires and forms regarding ESG will be only improved based on the latest data. And there will be particular experts in every bank who are in charge of ESG analytics, similar to security systems. In the meantime, we can be using current tools. Europe is actively using tools to calculate credit risks based on MS49 centers, expert of credit loss analysis. It's also possible to use uh, weighted models um, for risks for assets so that they would also take into account climate risks. So if we add the range of variables from NGFS, it's possible to understand right now how susceptible we are to climate change and um, test various scenarios, picking the best scenarios of transition to green economics. So that would be the most convenient and the most exciting. Okay. Let me tell you a few things about how these models can be included into current computations, current evaluations. The major thing for credit risk analytics, based on many methodologies in many banks, is uh, migration matrix analysis, so that we can evaluate whether the rating of the counterpart will change to triple triple B to C depending on climate risks. So we can amend our current models, adding climate risks and factors. Or we can correct model based on ESG score, ESG strategy score, and that score can be calculated based on expertise or based on the model. We'll have a case, for example, when they used for this machine learning And with text mining, it was giving a particular score of whether this ESG strategy is mature or not mature enough, or the strategy is just a beautiful piece of uh, fiction. So this score helps to evaluate the dynamics of risks for the future and therefore get the corrected version for credit risks. And the last thing that I wanted to mention today, what the ECB case teaches us. Eventually, ECB faced a problem that in order to analyze physical risks, the risks of losses due to flooded for floods, for example, it's important to evaluate geographical position of the company. So ECB has been able to find elegant solution here. They have developed a map showing how prone certain regions are climate risks. Red is fire, blue is floods, and we can be exceptionally flexible in uh, putting this map together. We can use the height, uh, the altitude map. We can use news analysis based on the frequency of incidents that we can map again. And then, then based on the company's indices, 
they have um, mapped the businesses and having put together the two maps it was possible to approximate risks of course the data is uh, eventually scarce so still this is a, a good case of analyzing unstructured data solving the essential problem and i believe that in the near future we'll see a number of cases when in order to evaluate climate risks we shall be using the data sources that are on the shelf so i believe uh, i will conclude the uh, overview of regulatory changes and i would like to hand over the screen to my colleague because there are a few relevant cases to mention Jan, thank you indeed what Jan talked about is both trustworthy and horrific because eventually banks will be approaching clients saying hey dude where's data clients will have to give answer to that question and Jan has been able to highlight if banks have problems with data probably other companies and industries also experiencing similar problems regulators are now paying special attention to make and teach businesses to collect data but of course um, we're doing this for the reason the reason is that risk is money risk is um, is money there's causality there and there is a range of industries that have been for decades collecting climate data and evaluating risks calculating uh, the monetary uh, expression of risks this images will probably not frighten you because this is what's on the news but this is what has been happening 30 years ago and was truly terrible we're speaking now about 1987 the so-called big storm in the UK that has shown to the entire insurance market that none of the investment in terms of regulation cannot help companies from going bankrupt this data is considered a catalyst for the development of certain insurance approach which is investment as a matter of fact into catastrophic modeling AI catastrophic modeling that every insurance company in the world is using now to transform risk into money and this is the first thing that any bank or any industry must be doing in terms of HD which is learning the simplest forecasting because catastrophic modeling approach is none other than being able to forecast based on historical data what event may happen and what may trigger this event so that it would be possible to simulate what terms of losses the company will experience based on what has happened and it would have been so great because we now we have uh, departments for data science and big data we don't need to learn new skills we can just take a um, huge data massive and start forecasting but it's not as perfect as it seems let's look at 2011 Japan huge earthquake which led to 16,000 casualties it was a very sad event for Japan and has shown that catastrophic modeling approach is not always capable to cope with the risks that was the point when um, insurance market realized that legacy based models are not given guarantee to guess the future if we take a look at 2018 let's compare um, real losses and forecasted losses forecast by RMS and air worldwide so all of the five major events you see are showing significant error and if we ask risk director why that happened yes of course eventually there were technical errors because when we are forecasting and simulating effects we forget that if we if for example one roof is being blown off that's uh, one sort of damage but if 500 roofs are blown off that's not one multiplied by 500 that's a very different sort of damage and now backend uh, mo uh, backends for models are not sufficient to to forecast scenarios that may get worse so what do we do the businesses are going bankrupt they don't have enough coverage everybody looked at data science and uh, they're actively using general circulation models not forecasting general circulation models math models based on particular functions that analyze every knot at the surface of a planet in terms of thermodynamics, physics, and chemistry. 
evaluating ocean and air circulation, etc. That is used to make a forecast uh, to forecast temperature of water, temperature of air, and changes of those. If we take a look at this particular approach, again, it's not new. It has been there for 40 years. It's only getting better. And that is real science, significant investment every year, fundamental research. None of the businesses can replicate that. But this is available for open use. This can be clarified. But the question is, what do we do with it? Because RMS as a business now evaluates um, hurricane rating based on this model to forecast the um, temperature of water surface. But it has not yet been possible to use fundamental research and apply it to big data. It seems bad. So catastrophic modeling is not working. Fundamental research has not yet been adopted. But if we take a look at these models, there are some underwater reefs. For example, clouds. It's not yet possible to evaluate how the density and saturation of clouds can make an impact on climate change. On the one hand, clouds are reflecting light. On the other hand, they are protecting from light. So if you're going to invest into this particular thing, you need to understand that uh, these models are not yet perfect. We still need to be investing into classical forecasting. Indeed, we can mix it with the GCM models. We can make the, our forecasts um, more precise, but the main focus is on working with data, learning to work with data, because there's more and more data. How can we, for example, uh, evaluate decayed fluctuations in Adriatic Sea? Because that makes a very strong impact on hurricanes, for example. So we have fundamental knowledge to start doing this. Regulators will only help us showing what sort of data we should collect and the data that we have collected will help us to implement our tasks because indeed the losses that are happening at the moment are making a very significant impact on both banks and other companies. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you very much, Michael. Thank you very much. And Jan also, thank you very much. And I hope that next year in our conference in 2022, we will meet again and it will continue our great friendship with SAS business. And we're moving on. I wanted to remind that you have a chance to ask questions to the speakers. In order to do so, please use the QR code that we're showing on the screen in the bottom of the screen. Please scan the QR code with your smartphone and follow the link and you can ask questions to speakers there on that platform. We'll try our best to give answers to all the questions.